वालेकुम सलाम एवरीबॉडी अच्छा वी जस्ट गोइंग टू वेट फॉर अ कपल ऑफ मिनट्स एंड देन वी विल स्टार्ट इंशाल्लाह Hmm. I think we are. Uh, everybody is here, so I think share the screen. अच्छा जी Just give me a moment, please. I think I'm having some issues in the in the presentation. Just let me. I think it should be fine now. Uh, Doctor Parvesh, can you hear me now? I hope everybody can hear me clearly. All right, children. That's fine. Okay. So, assalamualaikum, everybody, again, and uh, welcome you all to the second session of uh, extra oral radiographs. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing uh, mandibular X-rays, excluding OPG. Uh, the reason being is that OPG uh, has a lot of technical things, uh, which I thought if I included it in this session. um i thought it would just uh, lead to uh, overload of information and uh, i didn't but i wanted you guys to be fresh for that mai aisi kafi cheeze thi jo even mere liye bhi nahi thi so i thought uh, do a separate session on opg uh, hopefully next week uh, inshallah so uh, today we're just going to be discussing mandibular x rays and we're going to be discussing the Uh, american college of radiology guidelines for uh, mandibular uh, plane x rays uh, in the context of uh, facial trauma evaluation of facial trauma after uh, primary survey uh, 
All right. So hopefully today won't be too big of a session. Uh, so, uh, so let's do it. Okay. So the first X-ray that we're going to be discussing today is the PA skull. The PA skull is basically an X-ray which gives you an overview of the skull uh, rather than being specific for uh, evaluating any specific site. Uh, as you can see in the X-ray, you can probably appreciate a lot of the cranium, the mandible, and uh, you can also evaluate some portion of the mid face as well. So it's generally meant as an overview of uh, the skull rather than being specific for any uh, specific uh, location. And uh, it is uh, usually uh, predominantly done for uh, evaluating the cranium, especially Page's disease, multiple myeloma, hyperparathyroidism, uh, intracranial calcification. Uh, in the context of dentistry, uh, specifically in orthognathic surgery, uh, the PA skull is usually done uh, as a part of the PA CEF. And as you know, you, you have a lateral CEF and you have a PA CEF. So more, all of us have studied uh, all the landmarks of a lateral CEF, but uh, we don't study the PASF, and the PASF, PASF is usually studied by orthodontists who are evaluating facial asymmetry uh, in the context of planning it for uh, orthognathic surgery. Uh, so I've seen a couple of uh, uh, ortho residents who do a PASF, uh, and uh, it has its own landmarks and uh, everything. So unfortunately, it's something that we don't uh, study. And uh, maybe some of us who have done their orthodontic rotation as part of their FCPS or MDS or MCPS training, they might have uh, come across their uh, ortho colleagues doing this uh, x-ray. Anyhow, so like I said, it shows you the skull wall, the frontal sinuses and the jaws, and it is also done for the investigation of the frontal sinuses. Although it's not very clear, on uh, showing those frontal sinuses, at least in, uh, in my opinion. Anyhow, so basically uh, how this X-ray is done. So since this is a PA projection, so in this case, uh, you'll have to remember that uh, the X-ray tube is uh, located posteriorly, all right? And the film is placed anteriorly. Okay, that's why it's a PA skull. All of the dentistry projections that you will come across, all of them are PA projections. And uh, you will find very little indication for AP views. Uh, one reason I already told you in the previous, um, in the previous session on mid-phase X-rays, the first reason being is that when you have an AP view, that means that the X-ray tube will be in front of the patient and the film will be at the back so your eyes will be getting a lot of the radiation dose, all right? So we want to minimize the radiation dose to the eyes. That is the first reason. The second reason is that AP views uh, typically uh, show a lot of magnification as compared to PA views, all right? Uh, you know the rule that whatever, whichever structure is closest to the image receptor or, or the film in this case, that is shown most accurately uh, on the X-ray, all right? So as you can see, uh, in this case, the, uh, this is the image receptor over here. So the image receptor is close to the anterior part of the face. And if you want to evaluate the anterior part of the face uh, and you want to have an unmagnified view of the anterior part of the face, so the PA projections will always be the ones that you uh, will be favoring, all right? So in this view, you can see that the patient position is that the, the forehead and the nose has to meet um, uh, or has to be placed on the image receptor. And the X-ray tube is fired through the occiput uh, of the skull, all right? In this case, you also have to make sure that the uh, an imaginary line con connecting the lateral canthus and the external auditory matrix is uh, straight and lying parallel to the floor on which the patient is standing on, all right? So this is the patient position. So... You can see uh, that there's a quite a lot of anatomy you can see on a PA skull. Uh, if you're lucky, you can see the sagittal suture, the cristegli, the frontal sinuses over here, although in my opinion, they look quite opacified and it's not, does not look very clear in this uh, x-ray. 
posteriorly you might think that this is uh, the superior concha but it's actually the sphenoidal sinus over here again because of superimposition the differentiating between these two structures might be a bit difficult you have the mastoid process posteriorly over here a coronoid process over here the condyles are not very clear unfortunately in this uh, view you also have the superimposition of the cervical spine so you can see that the anterior part of this x-ray is probably not very clear especially in terms of exposing the teeth uh, so uh, that is obstructing your uh, anterior view of this uh, x-ray you can although appreciate somewhat the upper and lower central incisors you can see the body the angle of the mandible uh, quite clearly all right in the middle obviously you have the nasal cavity in which you can see the nasal septum and the inferior turbinates are somewhat clearly seen um the this structure is quite important this inferior surface of the petrous part of the temporal bone is quite important when you are evaluating this image for how uh, appropriately it has been taken all right so what has to be done is that uh, whenever you are evaluating a pa skull so this part uh, this uh, shadow of the petrous part of the temporal bone this has to fill no more than maybe uh, one third uh, uh, one third of the orbit that you are seeing all right one third to maximum half of the orbit most of the literature is pointing towards uh, that it should not fill up more than one third of the orbit so if it has filled up to one third of the orbit then this is an appropriately taken x-ray with appropriate uh, angulations all right so just uh, telling you the importance of the uh, seeing the petrous part of the temporal bone in a pa skull so here is a illustrated diagram of the uh, same x-ray uh, again i'll be sharing uh, this presentation hopefully when the session ends so if you don't uh, if you find that uh, the the real anatomy as seen as the, on the x-ray is quite confusing so you can use uh, this illustrated diagram compare and contrast uh, both of them and uh, hopefully the anatomy should be somewhat clear to you all right so coming further along about how you will try to explain such an x-ray if you do get such an x-ray which is uh, highly improbable that a pa skull will be given to you uh, as a part of your exam uh, however if you are working in the periphery somewhere where you don't have access to an opg or uh, and these are the only views that the patient has brought to you well the step by step method of uh, evaluating this x ray uh, is actually given in a very old edition of white and farrow uh, who have written the most uh, uh, i would say the uh, the reference book for oral and maxillofacial radiology and that is written by white and farrow so i think this was in a quite an old edition of white and farrow and you won't find this diagram in the uh, newer edition of this book so what they suggested was that uh, you start uh, by uh, first evaluating the cranium if you can see any uh, step deformities or any delusional lines over here so you start by evaluating the cranium then second of all then you will come down and you will evaluate uh, the orbits the nasal cavity and you can also see the maxillary sinuses over here after you've done evaluating them then you come uh, Uh, downwards inferiorly and you try to evaluate the ramus the angle and if possible the coronoid process of the mandible then you will come uh, forth anteriorly try to evaluate the symphysis and the mentum region of the mandible and finally if it is possible and the teeth are somewhat clear to you you can evaluate the teeth uh, of both the maxilla and the mandible so in terms of trauma this is how you should try to evaluate a pa skull all right so uh, as compared to a pa skull the view that you hopefully would be coming across more is the pa jaws or the pa mandible now, now the pa mandible it is usually uh, ordered for evaluating the posterior third of the body the angles the rami as well as the low condylar necks and now lesions such as cysts and tumors in the posterior third of the body or rami 
uh, can also be evaluated using this X-ray, especially you can, you may be able to note the mediolateral expansion. And this is something you cannot uh, do with an OPG. Uh, it won't show you the mediolateral expansion of the lesion. However, with the PA jaws, you can do that. Obviously now with the advent of CT and CBCT, so you don't, uh, you won't need a PA jaw or a PA mandible, and you can just order that view instead. Before, obviously, these modalities were commonplace. Uh, this X-ray was also ordered for evaluation of mandibular or uh, mandibular hyper or um, as well as evaluation of other maxillofacial deformities. So how is this X-ray taken? It's taken in pretty much the same view uh, as the PA skull. However, you will note that the X-ray tube is now placed uh, quite inferiorly and it is fired through uh, the cervical spine and the midpoint of the uh, ramus. The patient position for this X-ray uh, is something that remains uh, somewhat the same as the PA skull. So, <clears throat> So the anatomy, the anatomy is uh, quite similar to that that you which you will see on the uh, PA skull. However, as uh, they've sort of excluded the cranial part of the skull, you can uh, hopefully focus more on the mid face and the mandible in this area. So again, you have the nasal cavity in the middle over here. You can see maybe the outline of the turbinates inside. Uh, the nasal cavity, you have the nasal septum over here, and you have the shadow of the sphenoid sinuses uh, on top of the nasal cavity. Again, you will also see the inferior surface of the petrous part of the temporal bone. Uh, in this case, this is not used for evaluation of how aptly this X-ray has been taken. All right. Uh, that's only done in the PA skull. You also have the shadow of the mastoid process over here. Again, not very clear and not of significant use to us when evaluating maxillofacial trauma. These two white bulges or uh, radio uh, passages that you see over here, again, this is the shadow of the cervical spine, its lateral body, which is comparatively more dense as compared to the central part, which houses the um, uh, uh, your uh, spinal canal. So the lateral portions of the body, uh, those are more radio opaque, so they cause a lot more artifacts in this area if you're evaluating the posterior teeth, but you can still make out the central area somewhat appropriately. You can see the angle of the mandible, the inferior border of the zygoma, the coronoid, and you can also evaluate the condylar neck over here. All right. Okay, so uh, before I get into the most common X-ray that is usually ordered uh, in addition to OPG, which is the reverse Towns, you should know what is basically the Towns uh, projection. Now, the Towns projection is an interior posterior view, all right? And like I said, uh, in dentistry, in maxillofacial surgery, the projections that we commonly use are the PA views, all right? So uh, that is why the reverse town, uh, the reverse town's view is called a reverse view because it is basically a PA projection instead of the towns, which is an AP projection. All right. Now, as you, uh, the same old principle applies over here as well, that uh, whenever you are, uh, whichever structure is closest to the film, uh, you will be able to see that very clearly. So the town's projection is useful for observing any fractures in the occipital region. All right, but since we are not, uh, as much as the facial surgeons, we are not eva evaluating the occipital region. Uh, so for us, this view does not hold a lot of weightage. However, uh, the neck of the condyle, since it is somewhat uh, lying posteriorly or over here, or you can say maybe it's lying at the mid face, uh, mid portion of the face. So you can uh, evaluate it using the Towns projection. However, the same old problem over here also applies that uh, since the X-ray beam is fired anteriorly, so there is a risk of doing radiation associated damage to the eye. So that is why we don't opt for it. Instead, we'll be going for the reverse Towns projection. And since the condylar neck, uh, these are lying at somewhat at the midpoint of the lateral aspect of your face, 
So you can see the condyle and the coronoid somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat equally in both the reverse and the town's projections. So uh, what is this done for? It is basically done to show the condylar head and the neck. It is indicated in high fractures of the condylar necks, intracapsular fractures of the TMJ, investigation of the quality of the articular surfaces of the condylar heads in temporomandibular joint disorders. This uh, view can show you the mediolateral aspect of the uh, condyle, which you cannot appreciate uh, on an OPG. Uh, like the PA mandible, it can also be used for evaluating uh, condylar hypoplasia and hyperplasia. So how is this view done? Uh, again, similar method uh, of uh, doing this x-ray. Uh, however, you will note two major differences. Number one, in this case, the patient's mouth is open. All right. Uh, the patient's mouth is open so that the condyle can go forward and downward. So you can actually evaluate it uh, when it comes downward. So the shadow of the mastoid process won't be that evident on the condyle and you can view it uh, separately without uh, any major superimpositions. Uh, other than that, the X-ray beam is fired at a 30 degree angle, all right, uh, to the floor. So, and it is fired here through the, the tip of the mastoid and through the external acoustic meatus as well as the condylar head. So this 30 degree uh, tilt is now appreciated. And this is what differentiates it from the other views that we have seen so far. So there is now an angle, a 30 degree angle in which the X-ray beam is fired and the PM mandible is done in a, this uh, reverse town, sorry. This is done in an open mouth position. And the reason I've just told you why we do it in an open mouth position. So uh, anatomy, which uh, you will see over here. Uh, so since we are doing it basically for the evaluation of the condylar heads, you can now appreciate the condylar head over here. You can also see the lateral pterygoid plates, but again, that is not the main uh, uh, function of this x-ray. You can see the angle of the mandible and if there is fracture of the angle, you can appreciate its lateral or medial displacement. You can also see the maxillary and uh, mandible incisors somewhat. The body of the mandible can also be seen uh, over here. And again, the inferior surfaces of the body of the zygoma, the nasal septum and the nasal cavity. And over here again, you have the shadow of the sphenoids, but again, it's not very clear over here. So this is the anatomy that you see. Here is an illustrated diagram showing the same anatomy over here. So uh, if you have a fracture of the condylar neck uh, and it is displaced medially, laterally, you can appreciate that. Uh, what the major problem with this x-ray is that if the condyle is anteriorly displaced, you won't be able to appreciate that on, uh, on this view. And neither will you be able to appreciate posterior displacement, all right? But that you can somewhat counter uh, by having an OPG, which can show you uh, AP, uh, the anterior and the posterior displacement, all right? So how are you supposed to evaluate this X-ray? Well, basically you have to trace the outline of the mandible from one condyle to the other along the lower border, all right? So where, what do we have to note? You have to note any alteration in the shape or the outline of the mandible and any step deformities. The most common regions where the X uh, fracture can happen, those are the areas that you need to pay special attention to. Which areas are those? Those are the angle, the condylar necks, the body, the canine, the ramus, and the coronoid process. So what do you have to look for? You have to look for any radiolucent fracture lines, the direction of those fracture lines to determine whether it is horizontally or vertically uh, favorable. Uh, what is the degree of separation of these bones? And is there any overlapping which is causing increased radiopacity in that region? Okay. All right, coming to the uh, last X-ray that we'll be studying. And this X-ray, the lateral oblique, was very routine before the advent of the orthopine tomogram. However, since the OPGs have now, are now 
extremely commonplace. You will find very few centers, if any, uh, doing the lateral obliques. Uh, all right, there's a question over here. Uh, difference between towns and reverse towns. All right, uh, Dr. Sarva, the town's projection is an AP projection. All right, it means that the X-ray tube is in front of the patient and the image receptor is lying on the occipital region of the patient, okay? And in the, uh, in the reverse towns, in the reverse towns, you have the X-ray tube is placed posteriorly and the image receptor or the film is placed uh, anteriorly towards the face, all right? The Towns projection we basically do for evaluating the occipital region and the reverse Towns is basically done for evaluating the uh, condylar neck uh, and the condyle region. All right, I hope it's clear. All right, excellent. Okay. So, like I was saying, the lateral obliques were very common before the advent of uh, the orthopantomogram. Uh, it has uh, two divisions somewhat. One is the true lateral, which uh, I have already taught you in the mid-phase portion of x-rays, and you have an oblique lateral. The oblique lateral has further subdivisions in which uh, one is done to evaluate the canine area of the mandible and one is done for evaluating the molar area of the mandible. Uh, there was an, uh, a further subtype which has recently uh, come to my attention. One of my uh, TMOs was very, uh, uh, was very kind enough to bring this to my attention that an axiolateral is a further subtype of the obliques. And uh, it is uh, something that you won't find in books. I tried quite hard to look for it in books, but I could only find it in slide share presentations. And uh, since it was mentioned in the uh, x-rays that are done for evaluating uh, mandibular trauma, so I thought I'll also include these in the x-rays and show you uh, what are axiolaterals, basically. Okay, uh, so you can see in the pictures over here, uh, in here you can probably appreciate that in this x-ray you can appreciate up till the canine and the premolar region. So this is the canine lateral oblique that we do for evaluating uh, the canine area. And you can look at the picture inferiorly to that in which you can see the molars uh, predominantly. All right, so this is uh, the molar and this is the uh, canine uh, lateral oblique. Uh, Dr. Umair, this x-ray is not done routinely now. You still might come across this if you have any patients who come from the peripheries uh, who only have access to these x-rays and they don't have an OPG. Uh, so they might come to you with a lateral oblique. Otherwise, uh, this x-ray is usually not done nowadays. All right. So let me just show you. Okay, uh, this is another sort of variation of this uh, lateral oblique uh, X-ray, and this is usually done in children. This is called a uh, biomolar uh, lateral oblique, in which both sides of the molars are you can see on uh, one X-ray. So, but again, since this is not something which is done uh, nowadays, uh, but uh, actually we had a restorative uh, restorative candidate in the last session and I actually included this for him uh, but here you can have a look at this as well basically what we do in this bimolar technique is that we cover half of the x-ray uh, we don't expose it to the radiation and uh, we take uh, expose only one side of the mandible so that one side will come over here and uh, I have covered this with lead so this side is not exposed, all right? So I do this one for the right side. Then I'll use the same X-ray. Now I will uh, remove the lead covering from this uh, portion of the X-ray and now I will put it over here, okay? So when I put it over here and now I will expose the left side. So now you can see I have both the right and the left side on a single X-ray. Yes, uh, I agree, Dr. Nawan. there are a lot of superimpositions. And this is the reason why uh, nowadays oh, these x-rays are not done uh, uh, routinely. Uh, you could see superimpositions in a lot of the previous x-rays that I taught you uh, as well. Okay. So, uh, but 
like I said, before the advent of uh, OPG and CT, these things were uh, the norm or the standard. All right, so these are the axiolateral obliques. As you can see, you can evaluate different portions of uh, the mandible using these x-rays. So uh, whenever we wanted to evaluate just uh, or get a rough overview of the mandible, so a 10, 15, 10 or 15 degree lateral oblique is usually done in which you can evaluate the mandible as a whole. Uh, so for uh, a ramus, usually a 10, 15 degree tilt is given to the x-ray tube. When you want to evaluate the body, then the x-ray tube is given around about a 30 degree uh, tilt. And if you want to evaluate the symphysis, then we do up till a 45 degree tilt. So this uh, angles uh, that uh, I'm sharing with you guys, these were uh, actually uh, shared by my TMO, which I've verified online that yes, these were actually the angles being used. So 10 to 15 degree for the ramus, for the body, you do up to a 30 degree lateral oblique and for the symphysis a 45 degree lateral oblique, all right? So these are called axiolateral obliques. Achha. So how do we take them basically or uh, all right, I'll show uh, tell you that in a while. Uh, what are the indications? Uh, well, as you can see, you can evaluate the presence and the position of a lot of the unerupted teeth, which you do nowadays on an OPG. You can detect the fractures of the mandible. You can evaluate lesions affecting the posterior and even the anterior part of the mandible, including cysts, tumors, giant cell lesions, and other bone lesions. It is also an alternative to uh, an OPG when you can't take intraoral views uh, and they are not, you can't take them because either the patient has a severe gag reflex or the patient is unable to open uh, his mouth or if the patient is undergoing general anesthesia. The good uh, about the OPG, I'm sure all of you know that OPG is an X-ray that is done uh, when the patient is in standing position, all right? Whenever you're operating, obviously the patient is lying down. So you can't do an OPG when the patient is lying down. Uh, there is no modification to the machine in uh, currently, uh, at least to my knowledge, that would enable you to take an OPG of the X-ray while they're undergoing general anesthesia. However, you can take, uh, you can take lateral obliques uh, of the patient while the patient is under general anesthesia because there is a modification in its technique uh, for taking these x-rays while the patient is lying uh, supine, all right? Uh, in fact, the axiolateral techniques, uh, all of them which I mentioned to you, these you can take when the patient is lying down, all right? So if you want, if you put in a plate, for example, and you just want to be sure that everything is in its position, there's no flaring at the lower border or uh, anything like that, uh, and you don't want to wait for the patient to wake up, uh, uh, you know, go to recovery and then you order the OPG when the patient has recovered fully and then, uh, God forbid, your uh, uh, fixation and reduction was not appropriate, then you'll have to just take the patient back to the operating room again. So this is something you can do per op, all right? Lateral obliques, et cetera, these you can do while the patient is asleep under general anesthesia. These in old times obviously were uh, taken as specific views for the slivery glands or as for uh, the evaluation of the temporomandibular joints. So how are these x-rays taken? Uh, there is a principle involved in taking these x-rays and this triangle that you note over here, this is called a radiographic keyhole, all right? The basic premise, the basic problem in every plain x-ray before the advent of OPG and even with OPG was that there is superimposition of the other side. All right, which you've noted already in the different uh, pictures that I've already shown you. So in order to eliminate the superimposition, what was done is that if you can uh, uh, see, there is a triangular shaped gap between the descending part of the ramus and the cervical spine. All right. And in this case, if you can fire a beam through this keyhole over here, this is called a radiographic keyhole. If you fire an X-ray beam through here, you can, uh, let's suppose you want to evaluate the left side of, uh, uh, of the, of, I think this is the right side, sorry. So if you want to evaluate the right side over here, 
what you can do is that uh, you look for this radiographic keyhole on the left side, all right? If you fire an X-ray beam through this hole, you can see that you will be able to map the right side only without having superimposition of this, all these teeth and the bones over here, all right? So if you want to evaluate the right side, you will find this keyhole on the left side of the patient and you will fire an X-ray beam through this area basically. So this will let you map the right side without having any superimpositions from this area over here. All right. So again, you can see uh, over here, if you just want to evaluate uh, the right side or just want to evaluate the molars specifically. So now they've fired an X-ray beam through which area? All right. They're firing it through this keyhole and they've sort of uh, given an inferior angulation to the X-ray beam. So you can just evaluate these few teeth over here and the ramus, condyle, coronoid, body angle region from this side. And you won't have get any superimposition from this uh, left side completely. So here are those different angulations that I was talking about. If you just want to evaluate the ramus portion, so you do a, maybe a 10 or a zero degree or a true lateral uh, X-ray. Uh, okay, we have a question over here. Uh, what about anterior teeth? Okay, lateral obliques are not done for anteriors. Other than the canines, uh, you can't really see the anterior teeth very clearly uh, on this X-ray. All right, so you'll have to rely on periapicals uh, or occlusal X-rays if you want to evaluate something in the anterior mandible. All right. So this is done basically for up till the parasymphysis region somewhat, okay? So for the ramus, uh, 10, 15 degree or a zero degree or a true lateral, that will let you evaluate the ramus portion quite clearly. Then if you want to do, uh, if you just want to focus on the molars uh, of one side, because if you look closely over here, you are going through the molars on both sides over here. So there is going to be significant superimposition. So if you don't want to do that, you just want to have a look at one side molar. So look, this is the cervical spine and this is the ramus and this is that area. This is that radiographic keyhole that I was showing you earlier. So you fire an X-ray through that and you will be able to map the molars, the coronoid, condyle, ramus portion uh, quite uh, clearly. All right. So and you won't have any superimposition from the other side over here. So if you want to evaluate, evaluate the canine, so you can see that we tilted the X-ray beam further upwards. Uh, and now you are able to map the canine region. Uh, you are able to see up to the canine region quite clearly. You can see that I can't move this uh, X-ray beam tube any further uh, above 45 degrees. If I move it above 45 degrees, then I'll have superimposition from the cervical spine. So that is why anteriorly, you can't uh, see the teeth using the lateral obliques. Uh, Dr. Naman ka bada chha question hai, what about the submandibular gland uh, shadow? Well, uh, since the submandibular gland is a relatively a radiolucent structure, so that does not interfere too much with your interpretation of um, X-rays in this area. However, I'm sure that you do know that on OPG, you do have a submandibular fossa, which if it is uh, excessively pronounced, can mimic a huge cyst in this area. So that is why you have to clinically correlate your radiographic findings, all right? So sometimes you may mistake the submandibular fossa for osteoporosis or a huge cystic lesion uh, in the uh, posterior mandibular region, but actually that is just the submandibular fossa. Okay, all right, we have less than a minute left. Uh, so let me just leave it here. If there are any questions, just uh, write them with yourselves. And when I restart the meeting, so we can take the questions because I think after that, we just have the guidelines that we have to study.